to make our world as wonderful and beautiful as it is, we need originals. We need inventors. People that seize the day and put their own unique stamp on life. We honor these originals that they may inspire us to also be ourselves more fully. Now, as you approach the main entrance to the sanctuary today, you may have noticed a dozen or so pink flamingos. We were flocked. We were flamingoed. These were placed here by the youth of Emmanuel Lutheran Church as a fundraiser. We had this done in honor of the creator of the pink flamingo, Don Featherstone. <laughs> he was trained as an artist, and he did many sculptures in his lifetime. And kitschy as they are, the pink flamingos are what caught on and became a cultural icon for lawns across the U.S. We may be familiar with Weight Watchers, right? But perhaps not its founder, Jean Nedich, a Jewish woman from Brooklyn. She had training in business and worked for the IRS, among other jobs. But after getting married, she described herself as an overweight housewife with an obsession for eating. Nedich had experimented with numerous fad diet, diets to no avail but then followed a regimen prescribed by a diet clinic. After losing 20 pounds and finding her resolve weakening, she contacted several overweight friends and founded a support group which developed into weekly classes which eventually became Weight Watchers. Now picture the taste of coffee made at home from a percolator. You know, the same water is forced over and over again through the same grounds. And that's how most Americans drank coffee at their home before Vincent Moroda. He invented one of the first automatic drip coffee makers, Mr. Coffee. The son of Italian immigrants, Moroda, his products, his product's original retail price was $39.99. And that's about $226 in, in today's money. That was four times the price of a percolator, yet consumers still lined up for it. Dr. Charles H. Towns was a visionary physicist who res whose research led to the development of the laser, and he won the Nobel Prize for that. Lasers make it possible to play CDs, scan prices at the supermarket, measure time precisely, survey planets and galaxies, and even witness the birth of stars. Dr. Robert L. Spitzer was considered one of the most influential psychiatrists of his generation. He headed the effort to more rigorously categorize mental disorders for the handbook used by healthcare professionals. His most lasting legacy was that his, he had a successful effort to stop treating homosexuality as an illness. <laughs> Rosie, you may be familiar with the painting by uh, Norman Rockwell. It became a symbol of, uh, for millions of women who went to work in factories and other jobs outside the home during World War II. Did you know that the image was based on an actual person, Mary Doyle Keefe? <laughs> who in 1943 became the face of a newfound feminine independence and empowerment, and really the face of the modern woman. Keefe, an 19-year-old telephone operator, would become a model for Rockwell by chance, because she was a neighbor of the popular artist. After the war, Keefe became a dental hygienist. So no construction work or anything like that for her. <laughs> Ornette Coleman was one of the last great innovators of jazz. He came up with something that tore the jazz world apart, tore it in two, free jazz. Jazz musicians and historians still study Coleman and debate 
his influence on before and after jazz. Meadowlark Lemon, dubbed the clown prince of one of the most beloved sports teams of all time, the Harlem Globetrotters, of which he played 16,000 games for. Lemon was part athlete, part entertainer, but his flair for showmanship and his patented hook shot, sometimes from half court, had influence on the popularity of today's NBA game. Yogi Berra, the famous baseball player and manager who was an 18-time all-star catcher and the winner of 10 World Series. He was known outside of baseball for his original impromptu witty sayings called yogiisms. Like, 90% of it is half mental. <laughs> and perhaps a comment not just on sports, but life in general, it ain't over till it's over. These originals and inventors remind us that life moves on and the world is better for their creations, their laughter, their wit, and their ingenuity. These inventors and icons of originality lure us not to be them, but to be true to our own originality within. And as Yogi Berra once said, if you can't imitate them, don't copy them. <laughs> phase of history when many notable people from World War II and the feminist and civil rights movements are passing away. And more than any other group this morning, these folks probably had every reason to wonder whether they would make it to old age. Sir Nicholas Winton, known as Britain's Schindler, rescued Czechoslovakian children who were destined for Nazi concentration camps. Placing ads in papers, he found homes to receive 669 of them and arranged their travel through four countries on eight trains, persuading authorities to ignore their lack of official documentation. He used bribes and forgery and attracted Nazi attention. Despite his success, few people knew his name until 1988 when Winton's wife found a scrapbook in their attic with names, pictures, and documents. He was knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 2003 and died at the age of 106. Meanwhile, across the ocean, 120,000 Japanese Americans were imprisoned in U.S. internment camps. Snatched from their communities, they lost jobs and businesses, and unable to pay their bills, they often also lost homes and farms. A man named Al Sukamoto approached Bob Fletcher and asked him if he'd take over his payments and tend the crops while he was locked up in exchange for the profit from the harvest. Fletcher didn't have any experience with those particular crops, but he said yes and quit his job as an agriculture inspector. Over the next few years, he worked 18-hour days on 90 acres and paid the bills of three families, saving half of all the profits for them. When the Sukamoto family returned, they found their farm in good condition, money in the bank, and Fletcher's wife had prepared their house to welcome them home. Despite the fact that their families were being imprisoned, thousands of Japanese-American soldiers enlisted in the U.S. military in World War II, then Kuroki was the only Japanese-American pilot who fought in the Pacific Theater. He fought in 58 missions and died last year at the age of 98. Kurt Mazur also died last year. He was a conductor who transformed the New York Philharmonic in the 90s, but before that he did something even more interesting. A well-loved conductor in East Germany, he had won the favor of many communist leaders and served as a diplomat at a most crucial moment. When democracy protesters faced off with armed police in front of the orchestra hall, Mazur invited everyone inside to talk, and he recorded a message broadcast by radio and loudspeaker calling for nonviolence. He is credited with avoiding a situation like Tiananmen Square. Fatima Mernisi also stood up to authorities and is one of, uh, she did so as one of the founders of modern Islamic feminism. 
Marnisi spent her childhood in a domestic harem in Morocco, but went on to go to college, eventually earning a PhD from Brandeis. Her first book, Beyond the Veil, was a historically and scripturally grounded critique of the oppression of women in fundamentalist Islam. She went on to write many more books, and her critique was not limited to the Islamic world. She argued that while Western men did not put women in harems, they made women invisible in other ways. The Western man, she wrote, declares that in order to be beautiful, a woman must look 14 years old. If she dares to look 50, or worse, 60, she is beyond the pale. By putting the spotlight on the female child and framing her as the ideal of beauty, he condemns the mature woman to invisibility. Reyes Lopez Tijerina died this year. Fiery preacher and Chicano activist, Tijerina got involved in the Tierra Amarilla land grant dispute in New Mexico. After being stolen from native people, the land had been granted to farmers and ranchers as part of Mexico. After the Mexican-American War, a treaty stipulated that the land should remain with its current inhabitant inhabitants. But then the U.S. Senate got involved, and soon greedy investors from as far away as Boston and England bought and sold the land right out from under those farmers and ranchers. Later, in the 1960s, their descendants, many of whom identified as Chicano, tried to claim their inheritance back. Leading them, Tijerina threatened to seize private lands. He organized sit-ins, sit and he attempted to make citizens arrests of political figures, including the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> Thousands of heirs to the land rallied, and a gunfight at the Rio Arriba County Courthouse ensued in which two people were shot and two others were kidnapped. Later, Tijerina would be asked to stand in, along with Ralph Abernathy and Jesse Jackson, for Martin Luther King Jr. when King was killed. Rosalind Baxendahl was a feminist historian who served on the front lines of the feminist movement in the 1960s, including picketing the 1968 Miss America pageant, the event that came to be associated with the, what the media called bra burning. Reflecting back, she once said that the one thing she had against books about that era was that they talked about all the politics and the splits but they don't talk about the joy and the fun we had, she said. We knew we were changing history, and it was terrific. <laughs> Amelia Boynton Robinson was a leader of the civil rights movement in Selma, matriarch of the voting rights movement, and a pivotal figure in the 1965 Selma to Montgomery marches. On Bloody Sunday, she was knocked unconscious and left for dead by a white police officer but last March, on the 50th anniversary of that day, she visited the same bridge, holding hands with our nation's first black president. Speaking of Barack Obama, one of his mentors, the Reverend Willie T. Barrow, also died this year. At the age of 12 in 1936, young Willie decided she'd had enough of walking to school while white students took a bus, so she got on board, telling the driver, quote, we all alike, we've all got butts, and you've got plenty of room. <laughs> After that, black students rode the bus, and her calling was clear. She too was active in civil rights, and although she was just four feet 11 inches tall, <laughs> she became a giant in Chicago politics. The lifelong activist for peace and justice, George Hauser, has also died. After spending some time in prison as a conscientious objector to World War II, Hauser confounded, co founded, co founded, the Congress of Racial Equality in 1942 and was the last living member of the first Freedom Ride. Speaking of the civil rights movement this morning, we feel the hard truth that racism still kills. Police violence, especially toward black people, continued sparking protests in 2015. The Black Lives Matter movement gains momentum and shines a light on the way state violence through policing, judicial bias, incarceration, lack of access to health care, economic abuse, homophobia, sexism, and other interwoven systems of oppression takes the lives of black people 
specifically and disproportionately. We too believe that Black Lives Matter and this spring we will continue offering opportunities to learn and get involved in dismantling racism, beginning with next Sunday's guest preacher and the conversation afterward in faith that racism can be unlearned, dismantled, and overcome. On May 7th of this year, a New York Times obituary began. On an April night in 1960, Guy Carawan stood before a group of black students in Raleigh, North Carolina, and sang a little known folk song. With that single stroke, he created an anthem that would echo into history, sung at the Selma to Al Montgomery marches in 1965, sung in apartheid era South Africa, in international demonstrations in support of the Tiananmen Square protesters, and sung at the dismantled Berlin Wall and beyond. The song was, We Shall Overcome. Carawan didn't write, We Shall Overcome, nor did he claim to. The song was at times a religious piece, a labor anthem, and a hymn of protest. It had woven in and out of American oral tradition for centuries, embodying the country's history of faith and struggle. But by teaching it to hundreds of delegates at the first meeting of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1960, Carawan gave birth to the musical anthem of the integration movement. Now let's join together in singing, We Shall Overcome.
So we tend to think that what we experience and think and feel is what's really there, what's really real, that our senses and our cognition give us reality. It takes someone like Oliver Sacks to disabuse us of this rationalism. Sacks spent his career digging into the human brain, and not just with the usual tools of science, but by taking various medications to experience their effects for himself and listening very carefully to his patients. As a physician, he specialized in helping people who were brain, whose brains were giving them difficulties. As a writer, he introduced the public to the difference between perception and reality. He made enormous contributions to human knowledge. And he did so in spite of an inability to recognize faces and a probably related crippling shyness. He also felt obliged to hide his homosexuality until his last few years of life, when, delightfully, he fell in love. His life also teaches us that what we think about what we can do and what our life can be may be just as flawed as our perceptions. How do we imagine something different for ourselves and our societies? One way is through science fiction, which tends to take society as we know it and make some discreet but often enormous change, which is explored so thoroughly that the reader or viewer starts to think, well, we could do that, or, well, that's why we should never do that. Or, well, that's not so weird after all. Science fiction tends to be pretty much like our society, except it's considered absolutely cowardly and shameful to use a gun. Or, it's pretty much like our society, except people of different races and nationalities and genders get along pretty well together. That was Star Trek's vision. The Russians and the Celts and the blacks and the whites and the Japanese and the Americans and the women and the men and even a certified non-human alien are all friends and co-workers. During the Cold War, Vietnam War, the 1960s, so soon after World War II, this bordered on visionary. And by the way, if you resonate with that vision and resonate with Star Trek, it's no accident. For the founder of the series, Gene Roddenberry, was a UU whose goal was to bring what he considered UU values into a television show. <laughs> he did an even better job of doing that in the movie world. And it always seemed to me that the enigmatic Spock, played by Leonard Nimoy, my teenage heartthrob, <laughs> was not only the most obvious symbol of this visionary society, but if you'll excuse my saying so, it's heart. In Spock, we saw the struggle with difference, the hard side of the romantic cultural vision, the lonely life of the token, the divergent thinker, the person with autism, the vegetarian, the one who struggles with what to keep and what to leave behind. The man who made Spock real, Leonard Nimoy, died last year. Both he and his character, though, lived long and prospered. May the vision do likewise. Sometimes the way things are are so much a part of the world that even though we worry about it and despise it, we see no clear way to make a change. It was thus, 40 years ago, with the national security doctrine called mutually assured destruction. The strategy of making the consequences of attacking a nuclear power so swift and so catastrophic that no rational leader would attack. This was worthy, re reasoning worthy of Mr. Spock. It fueled the arms race, and the arms race not only got more and more expensive, the weapons got more and more dangerous. By the 1970s, it was clear that mutually assured destruction actually meant mutually accomplished annihilation. This was so frightening that nobody could even think about it, except the kids who complied with duck and cover drills to humor the foolish adults around them. <laughs> Looking back, the only thing we can say about this is that by the grace of God and the courage of at least two military officers who refused to follow a plan of attack and one dictator who backed down, our civilization and the ecosystem that supports higher life on this planet is still here. 
One major force that dismantled mutually assured destruction was the awakening of the populace to the word, to the word, to the danger, the word danger doesn't even begin to be big enough, of an insisting on change. The nuclear freeze moment, movement of the 1980s was a brainchild of a woman who made a radical proposal. Both sides have enough weapons already, so just freeze production and then begin to disarm. She proposed to pre pressure the national government through state education and referendum campaigns. This incipient movement was fueled by the publication of a book which vividly described the likely effects of one thermonuclear attack and counterattack the dropping of just a few of the thousands and thousands of weapons in the world's arsenal. The effect was described in the subtitle of the book, A Republic of Insects and Grass. The title of the book was The Fate of the Earth, it was by Jonathan Shell. Mr. Shell was a writer, not a scientist, and the information he published was not new knowledge, but he wrote the right book at the right moment, and it changed everything. The summer after the publication of this book, a million people showed up in Times Square to press for a nuclear freeze. Referenda passed in a third of the states, and Washington sat up and took notice. So did the world. President Reagan moderated his rhetoric. A Soviet politician named Mikhail Gorbachev took some risks for peace. The results were complicated for the Soviet Union, but a boon for the world. Of course, nuclear, even hydrogen weapons, still exist in our world today, and some are in the hands of very scary people, as we were reminded just last week. But even one such weapon is dangerous beyond most of our imaginations. But the hair trigger has been locked, and although disaster is always a possibility, we are no longer poised to doom higher life on our planet. Take a note, the ways of society which everyone knows and hates but puts up with because the way to change is not clear, can change. Just keep pressing on.